So you've probably heard the old saying that looks can be deceiving, right? Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. It just means that what you see on the surface of something might not necessarily be what the truth is. So sometimes you have to look a little bit further to figure out exactly what uh, reality is. And that's really what we need to do with our lesson today. And that is give a harder, more careful look at the actions of Jesus in this passage of the Gospel of Mark. And like last week, we're going to take, need to take a little bit longer in the Old Testament to get a really good understanding of what's going on. And because I don't think you can really understand what happened in this, these passages without really taking a harder look and a more careful look at what he was doing. And I hope we'll look back, as we look back at the law and the prophets and some of the Old Testament passages, that it'll become clearer exactly what was going on here. And I hope through these lessons and really the lessons from here on out to the end of the Gospel of Mark, that we'll, as we look in the Old Testament, it will become clearer to you why the Old Testament is so important because it really enriches our understanding of the New Testament because without it, then so much of what's going on, really, uh, we miss it. So today we're up to a section in Mark chapter 11 that really requires us to take that more detailed look into understanding the meaning of what happens because there are a couple of actions of Jesus here in these, this section that really we don't understand uh, in, unless we understand both of them and they are kind of misunderstood by a lot of people and these are the two things that we're going to talk about today which is the cursing of the fig tree and the driving out of the money changers from the temple and now a lot of us are probably familiar with the clearing of the temple but it's easy to kind of brush over this fig tree part and go wow that's weird and just keep going but but really what mark does here in these two stories is what he's using is called the sandwich technique. That is, he puts the, the story of the fig tree on the top and then comes back to it on the bottom. Sandwiched in the middle is this clearing of the temple. And if we miss what's going on in the fig tree, then we're not really going to understand what happens in the temple incident either. So we're going to read the whole of the cursing of the fig tree on both halves, talk about that for a minute, and then we'll come back to the clearing of the temple. So last time, just to orient us a little bit of where we are, last time we talked about the triumphal entry and him coming in through the, from the Mount of Olives through the East day, Gate on the Day of Lambs. And remember how important that was. Just as fathers of every household in Israel were choosing lambs that they would use in Passover, the sacrificial lambs, the father was sending his chosen lamb into the temple on that day of lambs. He was riding into Jerusalem. But after that, he came into cheering crowds, and the section ended with him looking around at the temple, surveying what was going on. Then he quietly left the temple area, went back to Bethany, which was about two miles away, and then we brings us up to our verses for this week, which begin in uh, verse 12. It says the next day, so he gets up next morning. And as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Then after he, they stay in the day, it stay in the city for the whole day. The next day, this happens. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. And I remember this story from when I was a kid in church, and it totally confused me, kind of being from a farm uh, agrarian kind of background. I'm like, why did Jesus just kill the tree like that? I mean, especially since the verses say it's not the season for figs. So what's up with that? I mean, couldn't he have waited? Couldn't it? Maybe next year would have it. And I, like a lot of people, struggle with why Jesus curses this tree and what was really going on there. 
Well, I did some reading and studying, and if you don't know anything about fig trees, while it's not technically the seasons for figs at this time, tree, uh, fig trees would, do produce a small edible bud that comes out before it actually grows the literal fruit, the fig fruit. So <laughs> the tree doesn't grow those who, that doesn't grow those buds is not going to have any fruit later on. So he's looking for those buds. There's not anything there, and so he curses it. So today there's really two main takeaways we're going to take from this passage, and so I'm going to talk about each one of them. But the first is that don't confuse leaves with fruit, okay? Because as impressive, impressive as leaves are from a distance, they don't mean anything if there's any fruit, or if there isn't any fruit, right? The tree that was intended to give nourishment ended up being useless. And at the end of this passage, we saw that the tree that Jesus cursed withered and died. Now, sandwiched in the middle of this, of the cursing of this fig tree, is the clearing of the temple. So let's read those verses as we go on. Don't, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple area and began driving out those who were buying and selling them. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And then he goes and quotes two Old Testament passages here that we'll talk about in a minute. It says, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you who have, you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. So, if we understand this by understanding the fig tree incident, then the fig tree from the previous verses and the following verses symbolize the temple. So what happened there, he judged and condemned it because there was no fruit in it, so it withered and died. And so Jesus is basically doing the same thing here, not a cleansing necessarily, but a symbolic statement of judgment on a fruitless system. Now that might be somewhat different than what you've heard before, so I want us to unpack this by looking at some Old Testament passages. But first let me talk about the Jewish temple itself. So this is Israel's second temple. The first temple, you might know, was built by Solomon and was destroyed by the Babylonians hundreds of years prior to this. According to the book of Ezra, some 70 years after that, the construction of the second temple began under the Persian ruler, Cyrus the Great, after the fall of the Babylonian Empire. Now, it was called Zerubbabel's Temple, and that guy was the governor of Judea and supervised the construction of the temple. That's why it gets his name. And incidentally, he's also, uh, I found that's interesting that he is listed in the line of Christ, both in Luke and Matthew, if you want to look that up. But eventually, the temple was refurbished by Herod the Great during the time of Jesus. It wasn't really actually finished until 64 AD, some 30 years after Jesus died, resurrection, and ascended. It's kind of like construction on 285, right? I mean, it takes way longer than you imagine, just keeps going on and on. But here is what the temple in Jesus' day looked like. Um, and and uh, it, it was very, very impressive to look from the outside. It had all the appearances of something great. It's massive walls, ornament, ornate architecture, and just sheer size. If you read the books of the law, you'll see all the detail that went into the construction of the temple, according to God. And so the temple courts out here were actually five football fields long, if that would kind of orient you into size here. So it's a huge area. The Jesus, when Jesus entered into the temple the, and began this whole cleansing, he's actually standing in the court of the Gentiles, which is this big outer court here. And it was an outdoor area that surrounded the entire temple uh, uh, buildings and, and architecture. So the, the idea for this area is that the Gentiles, any from any faith, any background, you know, could come into this area and they could see the Jewish rituals, they could engage in religious discussions, uh, and it was a place where Gentiles were given access 
and exposure to what the, the one true God of Israel. And hopefully that they would make a connection with God and want to come to know more about him. So Jewish worshipers also utilized this court, but it was primarily intended for an area for people outside the faith to come. So there was a, but there was a strict division between the court of the Gentiles and the area where Jews could come. There was an actual literal wall between the two sections and even a sign posted there that threatened death to anyone who attempted to go beyond the court of the Gentiles. It was really, really hard to overstate the importance of the temple to Judaism at this time. They believed that God's presence dwelt here in a special and unique way and that they believed that the only way that you could attain salvation was in this area because this is where sacrifices were made. And so uh, by this time, though, the temple was not producing the fruit of godly people, of authentic worship, of compassion, righteousness. Just like the fig tree, the temple had become all leaves and no fruit. So let's talk just a minute about if this was an, an area intended for Worship. Why were there animals and money changers and all that was going on? Well, that, there was, uh, at this time, a uh, corrupt system that had developed over many, many, many generations. So when people would come and visit this area, like it was prescribed in the law, they would bring animals for sacrifice. And during, this is Passover time, so during this time, if you remember, this was the day of lambs. You would have to have a lamb for your family in order to participate. And so every family needed a spotless lamb or they couldn't be a part of it. So those who traveled for long distances to come to Passover or who didn't own animals of their own would have to purchase an animal in Jerusalem in order to be a part of this. So that wasn't a, really a problem. The problem was how this was being done. So back then, the temple was run by the priest, and these leaders, like I said, allowed a corrupt system to really flourish that ultimately benefited them and the vendors who, uh, who, who set up their tables here in this area. And the priest justified this system by using the biblical requirement from Levitic, Leviticus chapter 1, uh, verses 3 and 10 and other places in the Old Testament that said the lamb had to be spotless. So if you brought your own lamb, uh, you know, to participate, good chance that when it is inspected by the priest as it was prescribed, that they might just happen to find something wrong with your lamb. Like there's a problem with his hoof or there's this thing on his ear or, you know, some little spot that you miss. And they say, oh, I'm sorry, you can't use your lamb because we found a spot or a deep so, you came from a long distance away, you can't just run back home or the local Walmart to get you a spotless lamb. Well, you, what would you do? Ah, I know, the priest would say, we just happen to have this guy over here with a table set up that has already certified grade A spotless lambs, and you can buy one from this guy, right? <laughs> so, uh, that gave them a virtual monopoly on sacrificial animals and allowed them to hyperinflate prices and begin to exploit people. And who benefited? The priests, right? I think things haven't changed a lot since back then, right? So to make matters worse, only a certain currency was accepted in the temple as well. So this was based on uh, Exodus chapter 30, where it specifies that you needed to use shekels in the sanctuary. This is probably done in the name of keeping the temple pure from uh, Roman coins or coins of other uh, faiths that might have, or other civilizations that might have uh, the temple, uh, uh, no, might have the got pictures of other gods or the pictures of rulers and that kind of thing. So they didn't want to corrupt the temple with that kind of money. So it's a good idea, but once again, it had been allowed to become corrupt. And so what actually happened that the system began being rigged for profit with the guys, the vendors and the priests again. So when travelers entered the temple, they would have to pay the money changers these exorbitant upcharges to trade the Roman currency and coins in for temple currency. 
and that enriched the money changers and then down the line the priests as well so for the sale of animals and the money exchange what actually was going on here is this, these priests who were supposed to be opening the way of access to god were actually peddling access to god now they wouldn't see it that way but that's exactly what was happening that you ended up having to pay once twice three times in order for you to have access to god for your sacrifice to be accepted now remember again the purpose of the temple especially this area was to be a place where other people other faiths could encounter the one true god but now it had become a place where they were being taken advantage of it'd be like if this church required paid admission or a reserve seat access in order to hear the gospel right then you require in order to buy your seat to come into the, the to hear the gospel you had to buy, change your regular dollars for church coins and oh you can use the atm out here in our foyer and there's an upcharge for doing that now how do you think that would be received by unbelievers exactly the way you might expect no wonder jesus is upset when he looks around so remember he's uh surveyed what's going on here the day before you know after the triumphal entry so his response is not one of shock he's not upset he's not in a rage he's seeing what's going on and is very purposeful in his response in fact, in fact the gospel of john tells us that before he did anything he fashioned a whip of cords now if you've ever done leather craft you know that takes a while to do it and do it right so he wasn't out of control here um, and was not in a fit of rage it was measured in a purple purposeful decision for what he was going to do so looking back at our verses here verse 15 tells us that he drove out those who were buying and selling and overturned the money tables now the effect of this at least for that day is that the business of sacrifice was stopped at least for a little while no doubt lots of people were upset shocked there was lots of turmoil going turmoil going on and this is really what caught the attention of the Sanhedrin, that is the rulers of what's going on in the temple there. Because it's fine, or you know, not, it's one thing to go toe to toe with some Pharisees out in Galilee, but Jesus has basically brought the game to the home court of the, the temple leaders right here in the temple. And so this was a big deal. They were all upset because they feared him as the scripture says and so the key to understanding exactly what's going on here though is found at the end in uh, verse 17 which he gives us the quote so let's look at those and go back to the old testament to see what he's saying here so the first uh, old testament passage that he quotes is isaiah 56 verse 7 and uh is my house will be called a house of prayer so let's look at it in context and uh, so what this 56th chapter tells us is it promises a future time when people formerly excluded from temple worship will be welcomed in, a.k.a. the Gentiles. Now, at the time, Jews had no concept of this idea, even though it says right here, let's read it, let no foreigner, that's Gentile, who has bound himself to the Lord, say the Lord will surely exclude me from his people. All, that's all. Uh, everybody outside the faith and inside the faith at the time who keep the Sabbath without desecrating it and who hold fast to my covenant these I will bring to my holy mountain and give them joy in my house of prayer their burnt offerings and sacrifice will be accepted on my altar for my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations so the people of Jesus today they believe the Messiah would drive out foreigners and they were fiercely prejudice against gentiles and if you remember some of the lessons that we talked about last fall that when he went to the area of tyre and sidon which was a gentile area the jewish leaders wouldn't even follow him there because they considered that the ground that gentiles lived and walked on to make them unclean so fiercely prejudiced here they had no concept of a time of unity of all people that was intended by god one day but jesus here quotes a text that looks forward to the very opposite of what people in his day believed. 
Now, Paul really helps us really understand this later on in the New Testament in the book of Ephesians. In chapter 2, he goes into a lengthy explanation of how the separation between Jews and Gentiles is dissolved in Christ. Paul explains that the solution that Christ brought through his death and resurrection was not to have Gentiles become Jews or Jews to give up their heritage and become Gentile. But look what verse 15 of chapter 2 says. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, that is Jews and Gentiles, thus making peace and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross. So when what happened when Christ died was that wall of hostility between Jews and Gentiles was torn down, just like the very literal wall that we looked at in the temple a little bit ago that separated these two groups of people. What was birthed in its place through the cross was a brand new man to replace both, and that new man is called the church. So that's the context and meaning of the first quote that Jesus gives. The other text that Jesus quotes here comes from Jeremiah chapter 7. Let me read the context here. It says, Do not trust in deceptive words and say, This is the temple of Lord, the Lord. Will you steal and murder, commit adultery, perjury, burn incense to Baal, and follow other gods you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house who spares my name and say, We're safe here. Regardless of what they've all, all this terrible stuff that they've done, safe to do all these detestable things. Has not has this house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you? And I've been watching, declares the Lord. And in Jeremiah's day, Jewish people had been living like pagans throughout the week, and then believing that they were safe from God by coming to the temple on Sabbath by doing the rituals and following all these Old Testament laws, uh, and they thought that they were safe. They can live the way I want to. As long as I do this, God's not going to be mad at me. It's kind of like people go out here today, go out and sin all week, live whatever way they want to, and then think they're safe from God by showing up on Sunday morning, sitting in church, giving it a little bit in the offering plate, singing new songs. Here, as like today, they were they thought their safety was in rituals back then, the temple, rather than trusting in the God of the temple. And Jesus is taking a big issue with this, with people who have become shockingly sinful in their attitudes, in their behaviors, all this stuff going on in the temple, and then they retreat behind that wall, behind. That wall into the customs, into the actual temple itself, thinking they're secure from God's judgment. Look at once more in verse 17 in Mark. It says, is it not written, my house will be called a, called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. So look at that use of the word den there. So a lot of times we think that he's condemning the people for robbing in the temple, but what he says here is that they've made the temple into a den. Now, robbers don't do the robbing in a den, right? So what is a den to a robber? It's their hideout. It's their place of security they go after they finish robbing people, right? So a den for robbers is a place of refuge where violent people go to hide from justice. Robbing in the court of the Gentiles and then retreating behind that wall thinking that they were safe from judgment, even though hey, they did been done, doing shockingly sinful things just on the other side of it. So in using this quote, Jesus is saying that the temple had become like a hideout uh, where they had taken advantage of other people and then they go back and they say, I'm okay. And so they don't care about righteousness or compassion or other people or even God himself. Basically, they live any way they want to, uh, justified it with the law, and retreat, retreated into their rituals to try to escape the wrath of God. Whew. Right? I mean, we're, I mean, they were doing a lot of stuff commanded by the law, but hadn't allowed the essence of the law to change their hearts. They thought that because they had the temple and did all these rulesy sort of stuff, they were okay. Jesus shows up and corrects that whole idea. See, the, see, the temple 
All that it stood for had the same problem as the fig tree, right? Leafy from a distance. It looks good. It looks impressive. It looks like there ought to be something there that would be nourishing to us, to the people who came to it, but it wasn't. So that was just like the incident. The incidents with the fig tree, it was all leaves. The temple was all leaves. It looked great from the outside. Lots of showy stuff, but there was no actual fruit inside. So Jesus enters the, in, uh, enters the temple and he pronounced judgment on it, just like he pronounced judgment on the fig tree. Basically saying, just days are numbered. It's days are numbered, but here's the best part. He didn't just say we're just getting rid of it. Jesus is also to, to de there to declare that there's a new temple coming. Two chapters over from where we are right now, Jesus is going to say plainly that the temple is going to be destroyed. It's going to disappear, physically disappear. Not one stone left on the other, he says. But there's going to be a new one that comes in its place, not a stone and mortar. See, Jesus would soon become the new temple where all people could freely encounter God's presence. He's going to be the place where they can find forgiveness, cleansing of their sins, not a building, and not a bunch of rituals, but his actual sacrifice on behalf of us. So Jesus pronounced judgment on the fig tree at Wither. Jesus pronounced judgment on the temple and the fruitless activity that was going on there. And in 70 A.D., the temple, the walls, every single thing that was uh, was there was destroyed by the Roman general Titus. In an sense, it too withered and died. And the new temple, the resurrected Christ, took its place, never to wither again. So here's where we find the last takeaway. Don't let good things displace the most important thing. Now, the temple was a good thing, right? God commanded the people of Israel to build it. It wasn't their idea. God came up with this, gave them very specific rules, regulations, told them how to, how to set it up. So it was his idea. And so they were supposed to offer sacrifices there to invest themselves in the temple. That was a right and good thing. But the temple was always a symbol, a foreshadowing, a tool, if you will, for encountering the God of the temple, a tool for finding forgiveness from God, a tool for worship, for sacrifice, for praise, for celebration, for repentance, and even a tool for others outside the faith to encounter the one true God. Religious leaders of his day turned a good thing into the most important thing. The temple had become a substitute for the God of the temple. They loved the rituals. They loved all of this stuff more than they cared about God because it made them feel safe in religious activity and accepted because they could point to all these things saying, hey, I'm doing this and this and this and this and this, so I must be okay with God. We kind of do that today too, right? I read my Bible, go to church, do all these things. I must be okay, right? But though God instituted all of these things, they weren't the primary thing. God warned us of this uh, mistake many, many hundreds of years before this temple was uh, in, in operation. It says in Isaiah 29, verse 13, it says, The Lord says, These people come near to me with their mouth, honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught. By men. So God's looking at more for more than just following the rules. He wants us to come near to him, to know him, and to follow him, and for our hearts to be connected to him. So really, what Jesus did with the fig tree and in the temple is very much like what we see the prophets of the Old Testament doing. That is, by his actions, he presented a visual picture of what was about to happen. So, what's the application of all of this? I mean, we're just learning some stuff about history and all that kind of stuff. It's never the point of reading scripture, right? We need to have something to do with it. So, what we need to do here is, is apply these things. We need to check ourselves on these things because it's easy to major on leaves and not fruit. 
and make the good things the most important things, right? We do this all the time, right? You can attend a worship service on Sunday morning, but fail to actually give God praise and honor the rest of the week. You read your Bible every single day, but fail to listen and apply its message, right? Because, you know, James tells us about this all the time. It's not just enough to hear the word of God. Doing it is what makes it important. So you can follow through, put a, social, a verse on social media, but fail to actually live it out within the context of our family, our friends, on our job, uh, and around uh, unbelievers. See, we can all be about leaves. All about the rituals, all about the things that look religiously re religious on the outside, feel good about ourselves because we do a lot of godly stuff, right? But unless those leaves are producing godly fruit in our lives, then they're only there for show. Followers of Jesus need to learn to concentrate on the inside, not the outside. Just, just how things look, because God doesn't change us from the outside in. God changes us from the inside out. That's what's most important to him. Remember, the parallel for the temple today is not the church, right? We don't have a physical building that we go to that equates to the temple. Today, uh, the temple is not the church building. The temple is your heart. That's what it says, where God resides in you. So the parallel between the Old Testament temple is what's on the inside of us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 uh, and 20 says, Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. It's because of our relationship with Jesus through his sacrifice. You know what? The Holy Spirit now literally indwells you. He's on the inside of you. So there is a brand new command for your life. And this verse tells us it's not just empty rules and rituals. It is to honor God. Honor God is the call on our lives now. That means that the choices that you make every single day matter. They need to be consistent with what's already written in Scripture, and not to keep God from being mad at you or to try to earn your acceptance before him, because you are grateful for what he has already done for you. That means we choose to honor God with moral purity, not just the actions. A lot of us would say, you know, I, I'm a pretty moral person, but what about your thoughts? What about purity of your mind? What about purity of your eyes with what you look at, what you watch, what you allow on your social media or in, 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 you know, what you take in by way of entertainment? Those things need to be morally pure as well. So we honor him with integrity, with honesty, with strength of character, and with doing the right things. See, there really is no substitute for doing what God simply says honor him with obedience you, you know, so but here's the thing is you can't wait till you feel like obeying him to do that either because it, it honor god it honors god immensely when we trust him enough to submit all of our desires all of our our our, our, our goals and our dreams when we submit those to him and even when our everything inside of us our hearts our Feelings are saying, I'd rather do this when we submit those things to him and then do what he says. You know what that's really saying? It's really saying, I trust you more than I trust what I want. You know, in the last few years, uh, I've really come to realize that the key to making God honoring decisions, especially in those highly emotional situations, highly charged uh, moments of your life, it's the shifting your focus, right? Because we really want to ask God, what's it look like if I do this five years from now? What's it look like next year or next month? If I follow you in this, will you just show me the outcome? <laughs> well, we always want to major on that part. You know what? It's not necessary to figure out all the details in order to walk in obedience to him. What I do and have learned to do not all the time, but hopefully more consistently, is I force myself to set aside those kind of long-term goals and ask myself a simple question. And that is, 
what is the next right thing to do. Not what I feel is right, uh, not what I think is right, not what other people are telling me is right, but according to the scriptures, what is the next right thing God would have me to do? And in the beginning, sometimes your choices are stiff and they're hard and you have to have just sheer willpower to do it. But you know what? Even when it's hard like that, those God-honoring decisions are still pleasing to him. And if maybe you'll learn to find out, as I kind of have over the years, is that the longer you obey, the longer you take one more step, one more step, one more step in the right direction, just doing it one at a time, the next right thing, you know what happens? Is that the clearer your mind becomes, the more settled your emotions become, and the more direction he can give to where you're going. So today, our one takeaway, if you don't remember any of that stuff about the temple or the Old Testament stuff, our takeaway is don't be all leaves and no fruit. Honor God with your body. Honor God with your obedience. Amen? God, we just thank you for the clarity that you give us through your word and through the presence of your Holy Spirit in our lives. God, give us ears to hear and a commitment of our wills to follow you to do the next right thing. I know that there's some people here today that are facing very complex things, that they don't really know what to do or how to follow you. God, I just pray that through the presence of your spirit, through the counsel of others, through their study of your word, that you would just show them the next right thing to do and give them the desire to follow you. God, I pray that you would help us to look past anxiety and stress and to rely on simply what you say. God, I just thank you for your word and how clarifying it is. And we pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen.